faces were pale blue. They had foam at their mouths. Three months later, Ypres on the Western Front wrongly earned the morbid distinction of being the site for the first gas attack. Bolimov went unreported, never investigated. Meanwhile, Germany's main ally, Austria-Hungary, was fighting for survival. The Russians had invaded and were now besieging the fortress city of Przemysl. If it fell, so might Hungary herself. The Russians sat outside for six months, lobbing shells, waiting. Inside, 300 Austro-Hungarians a day were dying of starvation. Przemysl was a microcosm of the Austro-Hungarian Empire itself, a crucible of ethnic frictions. Orders of the day had to be issued in 15 languages. Austrian patriots cheek by jowl with Russian sympathizers. Questions of race, questions of loyalty, fears of the enemy within. There's execution after execution. The Austrians are hanging people by the dozen now. Innocent ones too. March 1915. Nikolai Miaskovsky was one of the Russians preparing for the final assault. Instead of the total shootout we expected, there were only a few shots of shrapnel, and then we reached the fort quite easily. The Austro-Hungarian garrison had fallen apart. Przemysl surrendered to the Russians without a fight. The first Russian train crosses the River San. British observer Bernard Pears quickly realized how divided the Austro-Hungarians were. The troops, instead of being all Hungarians, were of various nationalities. The conditions of defense led to brawls and, in the end, open disobedience of orders. Austro-Hungarian prisoners were paraded through Moscow. A German official said, referring to Austria-Hungary, that his country was now shackled to a corpse. Russians bury the German dead after yet another battle. While great armies tore at one another's throats on the Eastern Front, a circle of small nations watched, like vultures, waiting to see which side to join. Forget liberal ideals and high principles. The question was, who would offer them the most? And who would win this war? These smaller nations, Italy, Greece, Bulgaria, Romania, also had scores to settle, lands they wanted back. 
the price of any allowance would be high. Marie, Queen of Romania, at her post-war coronation. British-born as Princess of Edinburgh, Marie had effectively led Romania as Britain's loyal ally in the First World War. She kneels before her husband, King Ferdinand. But behind closed doors, Marie called the shots. She was instrumental in brokering the critical deal. Marie had written to the Russian Tsar, cousin Nicky, and to the British King, cousin George, putting Romania's entry in the First World War out to tender. Being neutral, I get news from all sides. Each tries to persuade us that defeat for them is impossible. Promises and threats being dangled over our heads. The Romanian government, prodded by Marie, fixed the price for entry on the Allied side. Transylvania, the Banat and Bukovina. She added for George V's benefit... These geographical explanations must be Chinese to you, but the places can be found on a map. Her Prussian-born husband Ferdinand rather fancied joining Germany, but by August 1916, the Allies agreed Romania's terms in full. In Rome, Italy's leaders had already cashed in. Instead of joining the Central Powers, in line with pre-war treaties, Italy initially declared neutrality. But in October 1914, Prime Minister Salandra said Italy must act for her own national good. He called this policy sacro egoismo, sacred self-interest. In practice, it meant joining the side of the highest bidder. Few Italians wanted to fight. But the Allies offered a chunk of Austria-Hungary, part of the Dalmatian coast, and threw in a few islands. So without consulting Parliament, Salandra accepted, landing his people with one of the harshest fronts in the entire war. Italy's border with Austria-Hungary zigzagged for 375 miles into Europe's highest peaks. The Austro-Hungarians had the advantage, holding the high ground along the entire front. It was brutal terrain. Italian Alpine troops inch up to the front line. An officer beats out a rhythm for men hauling a field gun up the slope. In May 1915, Italian troops seized the mountain village of Cortina d'Ampezzo. In front of them, the vast Lagazzuoi mountain. By sunrise, the Italians had climbed its sheer rock face to a narrow ledge.
They were now fighting a vertical war. Above them, the Austro-Hungarians had fewer men, but showed a tenacity they lacked elsewhere. Austrian Colonel Victor Schemfel watched his men attack the Italians below. They threw several hand grenades on the ridge, which was about 100 meters below them. Judging by the screams of the wounded, and from the fact that the machine gun hasn't fired a single shot all day, we must have been successful. But the Italians clung on, two miles above sea level. Each side burrowed into the mountains and spent the next two years trying to dislodge the other. Fifteen men slept in this cave carved out of the rock. Both sides worked 24-hour shifts, digging tunnels, trying to reach the enemy's position and blast the mountain under them. Some went mad listening for the sound of enemy drills. My nerves are shot to pieces. I've got to calm down. I've now been in the front line four months amid constant fear and torment. Avalanches became another hazard of war, sometimes triggered by shell fire. Austrian Eugenio Mich was caught in one that wiped out nine barracks.